Hey, hi, hello. Welcome to episode 50, 50, <laughs> five, zero of Trail Society brought to you by our friends over at Free Trail. I'm Corinne Malcolm. I'm Keely Henninger. And I'm Hillary Allen. And Hilly, we missed you last time. You were away <laughs> at a bike race. You're currently away getting ready for another bike race. <laughs> Where in the world are you and what what race are you on the line for? What like what is okay. this thing, et cetera? Yeah. So Unbound, um, maybe people have heard it before called like Dirty Kansas, but they've changed the name of it. So it's called Unbound. There's um the they have five different events. They have a 200 mile race, which is kind of the main event. And then they have a 100 mile race, a 50 mile race of 25. And then they also have an unbound XL, which is a 350 mile race. Um, but basically this race is one of the, like, it's, it's a very popular race. It has a, um, it's, it's been around for, for a while now. Um, I want to say, it's one of the, like the big first gravel races in America and, um, it's on the grand prix. So it's the, the, basically this tour, um, where different gravel events, um, are kind of speckled throughout the year. And basically if you do well in this series, um, you're kind of, um, eligible for some big prize money. And, um, so this is a big stop on that, on that tour. Um, and, it's notoriously one of like the hardest gravel races. Cause not only is it 200 miles of like, of literally gravel, um, you it's notorious for mud conditions. Um, this thing called the Flint Hills, which, um, Flint is a type of, of, um, basically rock, but how it shards, it can actually be sharper than a razor blade. So it's notoriously for like, like just like shreds tires. <laughs> um, so it's hard from all of those standpoints, like from mud and mechanicals and, um, just to also like the, the distance. Um, so this is actually my first ever bike race back in 2019. Um, and so I've kind of used it as kind of just like a point in the year. Um, it's, it's just really fun. It's like to, to do like an ultra distance event on a bike. It's way different than running though. <laughs> my mom was actually there. She did her first 50 mile gravel bike race. It was That's the so cutest cool. thing. Yeah, I got to coach her a little bit to prepare for it. I gave her my old bike. Um, she crushed it. Uh, the the bike condition, the race at Unbound was so, so heinous. Um, one of the hardest um, conditions I've actually ever had out there. And I've, this is my fourth time doing it. Um, and I actually, it was really cool. I, I've been, I mean, I haven't been running for a while. I've been kind of dealing with this uh, ankle injury. Um, which is, it's been a little bit harder to return to run than I expected. Um, but, uh, so I've been really embracing the bike. And so I actually, um, I got to start in the elite field for the, for the unbound, which is, this is the first time that they've actually had a separate field for the men and the women and men elite. Like we started at separate times, um, which was really cool. Actually, it was a amazing to start in the elite field, but then B like, I wanted to ride a faster time than I had before. Um, but that was like, uh, I mean, within the first, you know, like after a mile 11, we hit this patch of mud that was literally like a hike a bike section for four miles when <laughs> it was just, uh, like bikes were breaking. Um, you couldn't even like, you had to carry your bike. You couldn't push it because things were just getting so gummed up. Um, it became a cycle cross race on accident totally. for a lot of people. I know there are a lot of mechanicals out there. I know I'm yeah. friends with Alex Howes. And I think that he went through like several, several wheels. Like he was borrowing oh, yeah. CO2 cartridges from people. Cause he ran out of CO2 cartridges. I know mm -hmm. both Anna Yamaguchi um, yeah. and Heather Jackson had like 60 plus miles of single speeding out there after derailers broke. Like what an epic I know day. I rode by Heather and I was like, what do you need? She's like a derailleur. And like, we have a different bike, so we can't do it. But like, she got it fixed. It was like, put it in as like a single speed. Um, I rode by Anna. Um, yeah, it was just, like, it was just mayhem. And like, it was just basically it was, yeah, you had to kind of like really, um, dig deep to kind of try to figure out how to finish and like have your bike be in one piece. And then we also had like crazy lightning storms and it just was like torrential rain. <laughs> Um, it was like something and then like really hot. It was just something for like, it was, it was a really, um, 
it was a race that had it all. I felt. And, uh, yeah. if one thing didn't break you, something else could break you shortly down the road. It sounds like. totally exactly as you had it, but that was the coolest thing about like, um, the gravel cycling community is like so similar to, um, I think the ultra running community and there's just like people want to help. And it's like more about the journey than anything. The, um, the pit stops are like so cool though. Cause you have like mechanics there that like spraying down your bike. I remember in years past, I had a mechanic, like I had, I brought an extra derailleur hanger with me and he like changed it out. It was just, it's like, yeah, you have to have, well, I think, yeah, I think they had to yeah. take the bearings out of Anna's bike. There's a video that I was, I'm friends with her partner, Chris Blevins and uh, his sister, Kaylee. And there's this video, she FaceTimed him from the mile 88 station and was just like having her own little dance party while she waited for the mechanics to put her bike back into working order. And you're just like, wow, like that is an attitude shift where you're like, okay, like she's been on a tear early this season, like kind of, I think dark horse status, but doing really well. And it was like, she's just having a dance party over FaceTime with her boyfriend while she waits for mechanics to put her bike back together. Like that's pretty baller. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's what you have to do. I think there's a lot of people getting frustrated with the early mud section, but I mean, it's just, it's something you can't control. You kind of have to just be, have that mentality of like, well, it's not going to be 200 miles of mud, but at least like, you know, just like find your way to find, find a little positivity to hold on to that kind of get you through the low moments. I was for sure using those skills out there too, because it was just like kind of laughable. Like, it's like, is this really what we're doing? Yeah. I signed up for this. I paid (laughs) for this. Yeah. That's, that is ultra. That is an ultra mentality. I think Mm -hmm, through and mm -hmm. through, I did like that, you know, you've done this race, um, kind of year after year now as like an early season mark alongside your running season, obviously, Mm -hmm. um, you've been riding your bike you ride your bike a lot, even when you're running, you're riding your bike Mm. a lot, lot because you're not running at all right now, but I guess kind of like, I would love to hear a little bit about just kind of like a difference of mindset or kind of like coming out of it with like, I I love that You're like, I was sore this year. I wasn't sore last year. Like I didn't know that I could push like that on a bike. Just like Mm -hmm. talk to that a little bit, I think before we finish up. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's cycling is very different than running, especially when you're racing it, like is a lot more surgy. Um, and like, you're going really hard and then you kind of settle and then it's, there's more strategy with like, you know, drafting and riding in groups and all of this stuff. So that aside, like, I don't think I've really been doing that (laughs) over the past four years, like when I've been riding a bike. So now that I've been spending more time on a bike, I've been getting involved in group rides and, and like doing like very specific bike workouts. So that's something I've been working on more. It feels a little bit different. It's, it's kind of cool to work on something that's just totally different as opposed to like running where you just, um, you know, you, you lock into a pace and you're kind of like there, right. There's some surges along the way, but it's more steady. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, it's, I think overall, it's just been fun to work on weaknesses and do something that I'm not necessarily, um, good at and see improvement. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just, it's been, it's, that's been really fun. Um, and I mean, I've been lucky enough, like, yes, like through, um, through this injury process, I've been able to ride on a bike, like things don't bother me on a bike as they would, um, running kind of as I'm just patient and like letting, letting things heal. Um, but it's, I mean, you can really like push and, and hurt in a different way on a bike. Like I said, I was sore this year and it was because I was trying to like ride hard for the, for like the whole time. Whereas before I was just trying to like ride to finish it, you know, um, which I think is a different mentality. Um, so yeah. And like doing things, I think that like scare you or intimidate you or don't like, you don't think that you can do it. It's definitely worthwhile. And it's been a fun process to kind of see, um, like how that can translate now when I get back into running, what that'll look like. And, um, that's also what I'm over here doing is like an ultra distance bike event. So instead of just riding 200 miles in one day, I'm trying to ride 200 miles for like eight days in a row. Yeah. So what, what event, <laughs> where, like, where are you presently, which Airbnb are you calling us from and what, what event kicks off here <laughs> shortly for you? It's called the Northern Villas. Uh, it's basically a and b here in Ireland. I'm actually in Northern Ireland. Um, and then I will cross over into um, the Republic of Ireland tomorrow. I'm basically doing this thing. It's called the Transatlantic Way. Um, so thankfully, um, I mean, I have a bike sponsor, Pinarello, and they are supporting me in, um, in the biking part of my athletic journey. Um, but basically, uh, like 
like there's adventure kind of like I'm on like the adventure tier with them. And so, um, doing races like this, like ultra endurance, um, things is kind of my MO. Um, and so basically it's, it is a route you can do at any time, but because this is like a race, there's going to be people doing it. Um, it's a self-supported race. It's 1500 miles and it's basically following the coast of the Western coast of, of Ireland all the way from Derry. D-E-R-Y is where I am, Derry, um, all the way down to Cork. Um, and basically yeah. riding all the inlets and like the coastal things. It's a lot of hills. I think there's over 150,000 feet of climbing in this 1500 miles, um, shorter hills. Um, but it's kind of the, in the ultra spirit of, you know, you pace yourself, you can't have any support, you're supporting yourself along the way and then see where you end up. Yeah, there's 10 like days, 7, 10 days 11, to do it. 7, 11, yeah. so there's, no, there's no crew for each day. No, there's no crew. So it's, it's How my responsibility. Water? I have it on my bike. So basically I have oh. my bike that's like packed up. I have like extra, it's very minimal, the stuff that I'm bringing, but like all the stuff that I need for the day's ride is on my bike or on myself. And then I have to just either I have a filter and then a, and some water bottles and, um, it's just kind of like that. So it's like, basically a, it would be in the equivalent of the running world, like a self-supported FKT. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah I feel like well, that, that is, that is a thing within the, uh, it's like the, this is more of a thing within the endurance bike space than it is within the ultra running space, because they have these like events in which, everyone is starting at the same time or heading out at the same time, but they're completely like self-sufficient akin to mm-hmm. continental divide or like the tour mm-hmm. of the continental continental divide. You can ride that route or run that route whenever you want, but there's an mm-hmm. event every year that is self-supported on it. So it's a race, but at the same time, it's got that FKT mentality to, it'd be like if there were a hundred of us that did the Arizona trail all at the same right. time, but had to be self-sufficient. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like it's kind of cool there's like this interesting yeah it's been, it's been around in the cycling community for a long time so that's it's right. pretty fun and it is cool because like you said you could do it at any time I could finish there's basically like a cutoff for this one it's like in 10 days where you have like kind of a, a party but you can still finish after that so and everyone is doing their own adventure the reason why I was do, I wanted to do it with the group is just because you have like live tracking and also it's just it feels cooler to be out there with other people doing it even if you aren't riding together yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's still an event, which I think is pretty cool. It's just, it's yeah. different when you're used to traditional racing to think about totally. like racing in other terms. Well, we can't wait to hear all about it when you <laughs> get back. Um, we've got a busy month of June ahead for all of us, but we're, we're stoked to hear about your, your Irish adventures on the other side. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So before we dive into some quick hitting results and some news that has both of us, our gears turning, maybe our teeth grinding a little bit, we had to give a shout out to one of the sponsors making this whole thing happen. Again, that's AG1. You've heard us talk about them for a long time now. They've been with us since the beginning. I'm currently in a friend's house in San Francisco, getting ready for the two craziest weeks of my entire summer broken air in Western States. And in my bag, just behind me is uh, the travel packets of AG1. Again, that, that, immune supporting, multivitamin, symbiotic. It's got a little bit of everything, things that I need to kind of cover my bases, particularly when I'm out of my normal routine. If you want to try AG1, you can go over to athleticgreens.com slash trail society. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash trail society. You support the podcast with every purchase. And with your first purchase, you can get a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs personally and travel packs big deal in my world when I'm not necessarily carting around like a 30, a 30 serving bag with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The travel packs are clutch. I'm actually out though. I just ran out. So it was actually a crazy one today. And I'm like, no. Yes. I know. I saw your big nutrition haul. It looks pretty good. We'll talk more about your nutrition haul here mm-hmm. in a little bit, but let's dive into some results real quick. Um, there's a lot of racing fast and furious. This is going to come out actually after broken arrow, but pre Western States. So we don't have broken arrow stuff to talk about. Sorry guys. Exciting race weekend that just happened up at Palisades Tahoe in all the snow. It's kind of crazy, but over the weekend, um, there's a ton of racing over at the world mountain and trail running championships, the comrades marathon, the Dipsy, um, not too far from where I'm sitting in San Francisco right now, like just really exciting stuff. Have to give a special shout out to comrades champ, Gerda Stein, 
um, South African, super, super talented. I think this is, this makes her third win at comrades also it's, which is the biggest ultra marathon in the world. It's a road, it's a road mar- ultra marathon in South Africa. It's really, really cool. I've been, I mean, I'm not a road ultra marathon person, but I've been told it's like an experience of a lifetime. You're running with so many people. She shattered the course record that has been around for a hot second by over 10 minutes. And there's not like an official 50 mile split because the race itself is 90 K. Is that right? Is it exactly 90 K or is it somewhere in the middle there? It's, I think it's like 87 K or something. And so it's not, so it's longer than 50 miles. They don't get an official 50 mile split off of this race, which is kind of a bummer because they're really freaking fast. Like her, her 50 mile split estimated is well under the world's best 50 mile time ever. Like she is so freaking fast, like 50 K to road hundred K distance. Absolutely insane. So just want to give a huge shout out, um, to Gerda Stein with that performance, just really, really freaking cool. Oh yeah. And it's 89 K sorry. So it is almost, 90K. yeah, almost 90 K slightly under, um, but she also set the course record this year at um, the uh, two oceans, probably two oceans marathon. Yeah. Which she also has done that in the previous years. She's done well at um, comrades, but this year she broke that course record too. So she's kind of on a terror. Yeah. She's, she's phenomenally talented and it's kind of excited to see what she, I think she's made the Olympic team for South Africa in uh-huh. the marathon. Very, very fast road marathoner as well. So I don't think a surprise. I think she was probably one of the favorites to win Mm -hmm. the women's race there and just had to give a five, five hours, 44 minutes for 89 kilometers of running. So fast. I don't want to do the math on that. That's too fast for me. (laughs) So we're just going to give her a big shout out and, and move, move forward. But yeah, super, super cool (laughs) performance. I can't wait to see some uh, like Camille has Camille Heron has won it before. We've had a number of Americans, including Sarah Bard and Devin Yanko, do really well there, placing well within the top 10, running really strong. And I'd love to see some more Americans go over and try their hand at that race in particular, both on the men's side and women's side. Cause I think the men in particular have like underperformed from the US there. And I think they could do really well. Like I'd love to see Jim do it. I'd love to see, I think Sage has gone over a number of times, but I'd love to see some more people like throw their name in the mm-hmm. hat there. Yeah. Yeah. And treat it like a more important race too. Yeah. I just yeah. think we're not, we don't get many U S runners to prioritize it as a major race either. Yeah. So. But I think it, you know, it is, it's like literally one of the mm-hmm. biggest, it is the biggest ultra marathon in the world. It'd be really cool to see some more it's so cool American talent there. Um, moving, moving across the globe to Austria, to Innsbruck, <laughs> the longest name of any race ever, the world mountain and trail running championships took place. <laughs> Over the course of last week, if um, you want to check out photos from the event and some recaps, we did daily recaps of all the races there um, over at freetrail.com. I did all the writing and Ryan Thrower did all the, the photos and video for us. And they're absolutely amazing so good. Um, imagery. So if you're not on social media in particular, go over to the freetrail.com website and check out the whole last week of racing. We'll also have a piece that is, has will have just come out, I think, the release of this from Sarah Kyes, who is on the women's long trail team. She wrote this really beautiful piece about her experience there. Um, the photos that are in it made me cry. Like Ryan Thurr got these photos of her being high five by all of her short trail teammates in the middle of the race. And Sarah referred to them as her literal life force during it. So it's just, it's really, really mm-hmm. cool. So we want to give a shout out to some of the highlight performances in my mind of, of the race week. Again, there's four races that took place. There was a vertical or a vertical kilometer. There was a short trail race, which was about a trail marathon, but with like 10,000 or 11,000 feet of climbing. There was an 87 K race with like 20, 21,000 feet of climbing. And then there was a classic, the classic mountain race, which is an up down race. And it was two loops. Um, and I think that was about 15 K in total length and it had some tarmac on the roads in town, plus some really steep up and down on the trail. So re- four really different, four really cool races. And there was also a team component throughout there scored like cross country for the VK and for the classic mountain race and scored on a cumulative time of the top three finishers for the short trail and long trail, which is an interest like that, that to mm. me is very interesting because it's. It's different. That it's it's interesting, interesting that there's two completely different scoring formats. And then after this race, this world championships moves to an every other year format 
Um, it was supposed to be every other year starting after Thailand, but Thailand was delayed. So we like these world championships were like eight months apart as opposed to two years apart. So we're going to have to wait now until 2025 for the next world mountain and trail running championships that will take place, um, in Spain, in the Pyrenees. So mark your calendar for September, 2025, um, should be very exciting, but personal highlights for me anyway. Um, Andrea Mayer of Austria, 43 years old, won the first race of the championships in the vertical. It's her 17th world title in 16 years or something like that. Like so bonkers, so bonkers, 43 years old. She was, I think she got bronze in the same event at Thailand. Um, just it's, it's phenomenal. Like it's so cool to watch women like that continue to crush, um, like the mixture of youth and, um, veteran runners at this championships is like very striking and it's very cool. Um, Grayson Murphy was third in the vertical and won gold in the classic mountain race, um, Mm -hmm. the up down race. And she was the only athlete of either gender to win two individual medals at this world championships. So no other athletes did that. Um, we had athletes that did race in multiple events, generally the VK and the the classic together. But I think we had some VK short trail people. And there's a German woman who did that, et cetera, and did pretty well in both events, but no, no one did two medals like Grayson Murphy and her, her the, actually going back and watching the race recap from the up down is pretty cool. She was duking it out with mm-hmm. Ove Alexanderson, uh, a Swedish orienteering athlete. And it was just like really cool to watch Grayson pull away and ultimately take the win. Um, mm-hmm. I might've been yelling in my kitchen while this was happening. Joe Gray mm-hmm. taking fifth in the vertical, like once again, like how many national championships has this man won? Um, he like shows up time and time again and just like throws down with like all these like new fresh faces. Um, Jen Lichter was fourth and so, and MK Sullivan ninth in the short trail race. Like Jen wasn't able to go to these championships in Thailand due to injury. She got to show back up here. She like, you know, got that spot on the short trail team that fourth and ninth were just super freaking cool. Like, and then Kimber was also in the top, was in the, like the top 16 and, yeah, and they uh, got bronze and, um, team bronze. Who was our fourth? Claire Rhodes was the fourth oh, yeah. female finisher mm-hmm. and she's 21st. So all four women that finished that race from the U S were in the top 21. So mm-hmm. heck yeah. Races like OCC, like the U S is coming for you. Yeah. Um, very exciting in the long trail. Um, want to give a shout out to Allison Baca and Emily Schmitz placing sixth and seventh. Um, Allison Bach is a mom of like a young toddler, like so freaking cool to see her mm-hmm. come back postpartum and like throw down at that in a really, really good field. Amazing. And then I was in tears, um, during the men's long trail finish with Drew Holman, Zach Miller and Eric Lapuma oh sprinting it in for fifth, sixth and seventh. If it was so scored crazy. as a cross country meet, they would have won the title. They ended up taking second as a team to France yeah. who beat them by five minutes. Yeah, it's such a bummer. And it's funny <laughs> because we, the U.S. men's team beat France in Thailand by like five or six minutes. So oh, okay. the tables had so, to turn on them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So still but really, really cool to see how fast they were running at the end. Oh, they were hauling down that final descent. It was like mm-hmm. a 4,000 foot descent to the finish line. Like they, I think they were absolutely running out of their minds. Eric LaPuma texted me afterwards and was like, I have nothing left. Like I literally ran, I left every that's like amazing. ounce of me out on the course. Like it was so cool. And then you, you've got one, I think local, I local got a little hero shout, out. shout out to give as well. <laughs> yeah. My friend, Liam Miro, he got 12th in the short trail or the classic mountain. Sorry. Um, and he went out first, hard first US and he went out hard. I was super, super yeah. impressed for him sticking his neck out there. That was really I, cool. I was so impressed. And like, there was a, there was some road in the race and I think it suited him well because he comes from roads. And so it was like fun to see him duking it out out there and still hang on for a pretty good finish. Like it's yeah. so cool. Yeah. I think there were a lot of, a lot. I mean, the, the East Africans cleaned up at these and particularly in the vertical and the classic mountain Kenya, I think swept Kenya almost swept the vertical and the classic mountain team competitions. I think Uganda um, pulled one over on them in the men's vertical, but otherwise Uganda and, and Kenya I mean, they, I think the top four or five men in the classic were, were, it was, it was like Uganda, Kenya, Kenya, Uganda, I think. And then Uganda again. So it's just very super impressive racing from the East Africans as well. Totally. 
I know they're fast. And they were 20. The, the top two men in the, in the classic were wow. both 20 years old. And the, the guy who won, won the U 20 classic mountain race last year at worlds in wow. Thailand. Got so, it. Really Dang. cool. Moving up That's to the senior cool. ranks and just mm-hmm. throwing down, ran a really, really smart race. So super cool to see. Hmm. But go Liam. Extra shout out for Liam. <laughs> shout out. He trains with us in Portland. So he's a wallaby, right? He's a wallaby. Heck yeah. Walsh's wallaby is coming through at Worlds. Um, and then <laughs> have to give a shout out because I'm sitting super close to the historic Dipsy race. We've talked about it before. We talk about it annually. It's really cool because it's a age and gender staggered start. And so literally racing for like, they call it racing for a black shirt, which is literally just like a black t-shirt with a number on it. And they give out, I think 35. Jeff Stern's probably like in the room next to you. And he could tell you how many shirts are actually given out. But Mm -hmm. um, historically it's like 60 year old women and men in their fifties and sixties and 12 year old kids. And then like fast, you know, fast men and women in their twenties, like all duking it out together for those like top 10 to 35 spots to get a black shirt. And this year, Patty O'Leary, took the win. Super cool to see. Got the fastest time on the day and took the win. But my favorite picture from the event is the top six photo that they took at the finish line. And it's Patty and then five women. Oh, very cool. Including like, um, Diana, uh, Fitz, uh, Fitzpatrick, oh, who's like uh-huh. on, she the, always she, crushes, the she always crushes. And she's like, you know, <laughs> she, and she'll run this and then run Western. She's not running Western States this year, but she's like, like she is the, um, the president of the board for Western States. And mm-hmm. she like, yeah, I think she was third or fourth. So cool. At Dipsy. Just like I love the on. format of that race. But I, I think too, the winning times or just the times that that like Patty has to run or like yeah. Jeff ran, they blow my mind because they are like jockeying around people. They're, the you whole have to pass time, 700 like, on people. these crazy technical trails. Like I the times they're throwing down blow my mind because I'm like yeah. I don't know how you can run that fast having to dodge that many people. <laughs> yeah. I've spent some time so on the cool. Dipsy trail and it's really bonkers how fast they have to run from downtown mill Valley to Stinson beach. Yeah, It's insane. Crazy. Yeah. So, so fast. congratulations, well, Patty on your win. Cool. Yeah. Really happy to see the top six be five women though. um okay let's move on to news you pulled something um to our attention that that has been forwarded to us by a number of people and and we've been Mm -hmm. tagged in things i think over the last couple weeks about it but it's about um a post that went pretty viral from a triathlete that really shouldn't have been like shouldn't didn't need to go viral at the time of day no yeah so tell tell us about it it was a post by emma emma pallant she's a world duathlon champ out of europe And she was running in the European Open. So the European Open for triathlon. And she's in this beautiful, like, pink singlet. And Yeah, cool race kit. It's such a cool, I love it, I want one. (laughs) Bring that to Western States. (laughs) But she's running in it. And in the photo, you can see, like, some small area of the singlet got stained by period blood. And there's so many comments from people in in particular like men who are talking about the blood and being like very upset that it showed and one of the posts was like not the most flattering pic of this person surely you could crop it out and I just feel like we really need to talk about this because it made me so frustrated to see so much commentary around this um especially from men. And then also, it also made me excited because the response by the athlete for this was really noble. And also she got like supported by women's running and by the female athlete project. And a lot of people were backing her being like, this is absolutely absurd. Like you don't get to make fun of this person or demand better when this person is like one of the top athletes in her field and just happened to have period blood, like staying a small part of her singlet, like, come on. Yeah. Cause it, the photo was originally posted, I think by another, like another person from the event, like, like supporting like her performance mm-hmm. there. And yep. then someone, you know, Emma pulled a comment where some guy posted not the most flattering pick. Yeah. You could have, you could have cropped <laughs> it. And her response, which is highlighted by the ath- by the female athlete project says, thanks for caring, but definitely something I'm not shy to talk about because it's the reality of females in sport. My period comes over a month in between and there will be one day where it's super heavy and I pray that it won't be on race day, but every now and then it it is. No matter what tampon I've experimented with for anything over three hours, it's going to be too heavy. 
So just as someone might get get gut issues in a race, I have to suck it up and give what I have and not be afraid to talk to women who have the same problem. And I just like really loved her response to it. And I think that, you know, it's, it's very validating. I know, um, Ladia, um, Albertson Jenkins, when she ran Western States in 2018, 2019, I cannot remember what year it was that I was also racing and the Brooks kit was white on white. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, like I, I was going to bleed through my uniform no matter what I did. And she was like, that's just the reality of like being a female athlete. Sometimes like we get our periods all the time. Like it happens during competition, not infrequently. Like that's the reality of being a female athlete. Like why do we have to shy away from this topic? Yeah, totally. And I think it's also just like this, it's not a fair narrative either because we're, we're trying to commend people by having their period because having your period as a female athlete is really important and really great and a very good beacon of health. And yet like when we have it, that it happens to ha- like happen on race day, it's we're going to get ridiculed for it's it. Messy. Like that's not fair. That's not like allowed because it's something we need to have. And so if it accidentally leaks out during race day, that is not our fault. And it's one of those things where it's like, we're, we're normalizing the conversation around menstruation. It's really, really important to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. it's been highlighted well by a number of athletes and by podcasts like this. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting is that it's like, we're so many people are like, okay, cool. You can normalize talking about it, but we don't want to see it. We don't want to deal with the messy reality of Mm -hmm. your life and being female or being a female in sport or whatever it is, or a person or person who gets their period right in sport. And I think that it's, yeah. It's just like, it's very frustrating where it's like, okay, we can support you for this, but not, we don't, we're not going to support like the reality of your existence mm-hmm. and the reality of your life. And to me, that's oh my just gosh. like, yep. uh, I don't know. It brings shame and humility and it makes the topic taboo again and all that kind of stuff. It's like this, this vicious cycle of not actual support for what people who experience a menstrual cycle go through. Sorry. <laughs> we got we got dogs yeah. we got nope. dogs losing it on keely's end <laughs> um oh my gosh uh yeah but what you were just saying reminded me of a conversation i had with someone from acsm who's based out of south africa and they were talking about how there's been a lot of initiatives finally around increasing the knowledge for these young girls around menstruation but that there's been no backing for supplies or areas for women to deal with the situation, right? Like, yeah. it's kind of like your point, like we're, we're talking about it, but we're not actually like thinking about it holistically and thinking about the repercussions of it and like trying to put things in place to make it not so messy for people, right? Yeah, like, we tax biggest, those products in a lot of places. Yeah, like, like, there's high taxes on menstrual products, which is kind of, yeah. it's total, it's not kind of BS, it's total BS. And it's just like, it's a barrier to entry. Right. The yeah. same with like sports bras and sports bra initiatives mm-hmm. for yep. for people in sport where it's like that is that lowers the barrier of entry to keep young like female athletes in sport. And so I think that mm-hmm. that is similar here where it's like the narrative needs to be around education, around support, around appropriate messaging, around breaking the shame cycle, et cetera. And so I was, yeah, once again, just very like thrilled to see the support for this triathlete and like her response to the commenter, et cetera, because like, screw that. I was going to swear more there and I decided that that's not appropriate. <laughs> so yeah, I've got some expletives that I would like to use in that situation because <laughs> that's how I feel about it. And, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's just also, it's like, when would she, when should she have like figured out how to change that during this high level race? Like, yeah. I don't know. It's just like, come on, you can't point that out. That's not our fault. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think it's really cool that a lot of people are addressing this, like a lot of big brands, like your brand included Adidas, like took a huge leap with this and was one of the first to launch like a period product mm-hmm. where they've like, you know, incorporated really high um, density material into the, the liner of the short so that it can yep. absorb more fluid. Um, like, and so you see that now with a lot of brands, they're trying to make stuff that's here, like better, period focused athletic but, wear, i.e. akin to like, their are like period, I think they're called period panties, but it's like, yeah, period yep. underwear. Right. So mm-hmm. you wouldn't have to use a tampon or it's, it's, it's backup, right. In case you are someone who bleeds right. through, um, regularly, it gives you that kind of additional support protection, et cetera. And yeah, so Adidas is making a number of, um, 
like exercise garments that have that feature built in. So they, yeah, you can feel comfortable at the gym or mm-hmm. out on the field or whatever it is during that time of the month. Totally. Yeah. Because we're not like as a society, we're not at a place to make people feel comfortable otherwise. And so hiding it for now, I guess, is like the the best thing we can do <laughs> until we're like a little more normalized with the, you know, the nastiness of it. Cause it's like, it's normal. Yeah. It's totally it's- normal and it's okay. A hundred percent there, are, yeah. you know, there, are, we, we all have friends who probably have horror stories of like, yeah, like bleed, bleeding onto sheets or whatever. Mm-hmm. And just like feeling that shame, feeling that embarrassment and like having the right and wrong people make you feel bad or, or mm-hmm. make you feel empowered or, you know, it's like, we're trying to raise strong, sassy daughters, but we also have to raise like smart and thoughtful humans. Mm-hmm. So, yeah goes both ways. Um, it shouldn't be on the, on the people who menstruate on the women, on the females, et cetera, who, um, shouldn't be all on them to make it normal, make it right. It should just be society as a whole. Totally. Yeah. We We all have uteruses. It happens. Let's, let's get rid of that one in four women who drop out of sport do, do so because of menstrual like problems that should not be a stat anymore. Yeah. Let's, we we're we're over it. It's done. It's out. <laughs> it's out for 2023. In for 2023, people being stoked on menstruation. Out for 2023. Do you see that part of SNL that does this? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I love the ins and outs. I'm all about I it. it. <laughs> yeah. It's like I out for 2023 for me is setbacks. I'm just not doing them anymore. Um, so I feel that. Okay. We're going to move, move towards our meat and potatoes for today, but that's, I think, good f- food for thought for all of us. And if you have any like thoughts, solutions, things that you're seeing in your communities that are in and around menstrual education or products or support for young athletes who are dealing with menstruation, maybe for the first time ever, we would love to hear about them and highlight them on the podcast. So reach out in our DMs. Um, love, love to hear about that. Love to chat with you all more about that. We had to give a shout out to the feed. One of one of the organizations helping to fuel Keeley to Western States success here in a little bit. Um, we've been loving working with them. They've been a huge, a huge support for us for the last year, um, feeding us all the snacks we could ever imagine if you would like to try the feed. And again, that's kind of a, it's a one-stop shop for all your nutritional needs. Nutritional needs means you can try flavors of things without committing to like a 20 pack of anything, which is in my mind, really nice. And they're pretty thoughtful about packaging and getting it to you very quickly. Again, that's going to be the www.thefeed.com slash trail society there. You can get a $15 credit to spend on $35 of product. Um, you get free shipping with orders of $50 and you get that quarterly and it is automatically added to your account quarterly, which is really cool. It auto added to my account just last month. And I was thrilled about it. So Keely, what's, uh, what's in your big snack box right now going into Western States? <laughs> Okay. And my big snack box was, okay. First of all, coffee, but I never not get coffee. <laughs> I <laughs> get a lot of people are like, you of course coffee. there's coffee in there, but honestly, the feed has phenomenal coffee. They're both two like local roasters out of Boulder. I don't know if you guys have tried them, but highly recommend. I definitely am kind of a coffee snob and they passed my test. Um, and then I did a ton of, uh, I don't know if you've tried this yet, but RX bar makes granola. I saw that for the first time recently. It's good. Yes. I like it. I love granola. So I kind of always try the new granolas on the feed. And so I tried the RX bar regular and the RX bar peanut butter and highly recommend. I really like them. Um, so I got two bags of those and then I got a bunch of just like different hydration stuff just to kind of mix up while I'm here at altitude. Cause I was feeling like I was thirsty all the time. So I got like some liquid IVs and just random stuff because sometimes you just want something that tastes a little different to throw into your mix. Um, so I love it. Heck yeah. yeah. Check out the feed. We love them. They've been a, a huge support and it's been really fun to get yeah snack boxes. I've got a big one that I couldn't order quite yet. Cause I want it to hit when I get home and they ship too rapidly. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I can't like be like, Hey, know, can you ship this so on the 26th? Um, so I can't, I can't afford to have that sitting out on our doorstep. Um, the squirrels will get it instead of me. So, but moving to our meat and potatoes, it's really, really exciting. We have an amazing interview with another local um, Seattle baddie, but it's kind of, we're on a theme here. It's, we're kind of on this body wisdom, disordered eating journey, um, which just, you know, keep in mind, like, I think that Caitlin does a really good job. Caitlin Jacobson is who we're talking to. I'll give her official intro here in a second, but 
if this is a if this is kind of a topic area for you that is personally really triggering or hard to deal with, you don't need to listen to it. You can skip it. You can come back to us in the post Western states glow that we will all have um, because it can be a hard topic. But she does a really good job talking about her personal story, talking about the work she does, and I think a lot of practical like human takeaways that I personally really enjoyed. So the interview we're going to jump into is with Caitlin Jacobson. She's a certified eating disorder recovery coach and registered counselor agency affiliate. She works at Opal Food and Body Wisdom in Seattle, Washington, which is one of the it's one of three organizations in the country that has this kind of like everyone's an athlete um, exercise focused recovery program. Uh, she holds a master's degree in integrative physio. Uh, physiological sciences from UCLA and a bachelor's in neuroscience from Claremont McKinney college. She is the mother to two very strong, very athletic daughters and to one very artistic son who helps the whole family slow down and enjoy the little things. And I think with that, we're going to get out of the way and we'll dive into our interview with Caitlin. Hi, um, I'm Caitlin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently located in Issaquah, Washington, just outside of Seattle. I am a white, cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied, financially secure female living in a thin body. Um, I do feel that those privileges are important for me to acknowledge, especially through parts of the conversation we'll be having today um, in my role as a professional in the eating disorder space. Um, I'm also a mother of three children with strong athlete identities ages 10, 12, and 13, a wife to a material scientist, a daughter, a friend, um, a friend to a lot of incredibly strong, badass, powerful trail runners um, who mean the world to me, a sister, a dog owner to a 13-year-old rescue mutt um, who hopefully will be quiet on this call, but is right by me, so we'll see. Um, I currently work at Opal Food and Body Wisdom, which is an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle. I work on the exercise and sport team and also as a co-leader of Radically Open Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, um, which I'm happy to talk about in more detail later if we go that route. Um, In addition, I have a small private practice as a recovery coach um, and as a mentor to athletes in eating disorder recovery. I am originally from the south side of Chicago, um, so have Midwest roots. I Grew up in an underprivileged family, raised by a mother with a high school degree and a disabled father. I am passionate about the intersection of privilege, systems of oppression, and fat phobia in the development of eating disorders, um, as well as the effect of trauma on mental health. Um, And I am a strong advocate for gender-informed and health at every size approach in the eating disorder community. Um, and lastly, I love trail and mountain and running, uh, racing, running and racing. So yeah, those are some parts of <laughs> Yeah. What she forgets to add is that she, she herself, she has friends to a bunch of badass lady trail runners, but she herself is also a badass trail runner, um, here in the Seattle area and beyond. She, I think we mentioned actually your tiger claw 50 mile finish on an episode, a few episodes back when we, we touched on a little tiger claw shout out. So, um, Caitlin, yeah, help, helps us all. We've got quite the quite the posse of runners here in the Seattle area that I feel fortunate to get to call my uh, my new my new home. We're trying to get Keely to come here too. UW Medical School, Keely, come join us. But for now, she'll stay in Portland. You touched on a lot of things in your introduction that have definitely been monumental in shaping your life and kind of where you're at at this point. And I guess I brought this up in a lot of interviews recently, this idea that we're this amalgamation of all of our life experiences that have brought us to what we're doing, maybe professionally or otherwise in our lives. And I'm wondering for you, as you like reflect on those experiences, if you can kind of dive deeper into how those like early childhood, high school and college experiences, as long as well as experiences with your family, your personal family growing up, how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah. Um, Sure. Yeah. So over the last couple of years, I've thought a lot about um, how the work I'm doing today and the life that I'm currently living um, truly feels like a dream and is kind of this combination of like all these life experiences have brought me to doing what I'm doing now um, professionally and personally. And so a lot of my life experiences, personal history with trauma, um, including a decade long eating disorder um, around ages 12 to 22 ish. Um, And then 14 years now living in recovery, 
um, with a strong athlete identity, um, mostly as a distance runner, really, I think, has deeply informed the work that I do at Opal and how I mother, how I parent, how I relate with others as a friend, um, and really how I at least try to show up in every facet of my life and relationships. Um, so part of, yeah, I, I mean, I, I won't go super deep into trauma um, or my early childhood experiences, um, but to say that definitely, I think our, I mean, I, uh, part of my education also involved studying early childhood development um, post-college, and I have learned how those early childhood um, experiences like truly shape who we are and who we become. Um, so from an early age, I experienced growing up in a difficult family environment um, where my father was recovering from a workplace accident um, where he lost his vision. And so he's been blind ever since. Um, and that occurred about two years before I was born, before I was brought into this world. Um, so I grew up really independent, um, learning that it was not safe to have needs and or that my needs um, were not able to be met. I'm a middle child of four. Um, my mom was suffering from postpartum depression which went um, untreated and was also really raising my older sister and myself um, who were born just 19 months apart. Um, as my dad was learning to live in this world as a blind person, learning to read, write in braille um, and went back to school for social work ultimately um, when I was a baby. And so you know, family histories are really complicated um, but definitely shape us. And with all that said, my parents are also the hardest workers I've ever seen. Um, they truly didn't have the privilege to slow down or to rest. And I think a lot of um, the traits I inherited and that were modeled to me um, have been, yeah, just huge parts of my story. And a lot of my own work has been in learning how to rest, learning how to slow down. Um, so, yeah, my, they worked multiple jobs to get food on the table. And even then, we grew up with a lot of food scarcity, um, but also with so much love. And when I think of like my first five years of life, um, I always felt as if we had everything and more. Um, and as a young child, I never sensed a feeling of lack. Um, I think that's because I never ever heard them complain about anything. Um, and I think about that. I try to think about that in my own parenting, um, just when life gets hard and during COVID and during so many just hard experiences, um, you know, that we've all had is like, how can I? Um, yeah, show up in these ways for my kid and kids and model the struggle, model vulnerability, um, but also model like so much gratitude. Um, yeah, so all to say, like my parents viewed it, parents um, that parented us in a really beautiful way, um, but also was messy and real. And some of my deepest values are directly um, from the way I was raised, including my work ethic, deep sense of gratitude, empathy. Um, and then parts of that um, growing up in this really fiercely independent way was why I left Chicago at age 18. Um, my parents never had the opportunity to go to college. And so once we were more financially secure as a family, um, they really prioritized education. And I saw that as my way out. Um, I started running around age 12 and immediately had some success. Um, also, that was when my body was changing, going through puberty, and there's a lot of, um, yeah, so many factors at play, but a lot of uncertainty and scare and like fear of how body changes would affect my running. Um, so I ended up going out west to run cross country and track for Division Three Claremont um, McKenna College, which is their teams are together, CMS with Claremont Mud Scripts. Um, and looking back, I now know that I was already deep in the throes of an eating disorder um, and the team culture, culture there absolutely fed it to the extreme. Um, I do think an important thing to note about eating disorders, both in my case and in general, is that they're an incredibly powerful coping tool. And so even though a lot of my story has to do with how my ED intersected with running, um, truly it had so much more to do with just a sense of survival and safety. And control. Right. Yeah, control, getting needs met. Um, it was this way for me to be seen. And that's, yeah, that's a big part of my story. And so many others is like this external validation, um, being cared for in a really indirect way um, because I wasn't able, I think growing up, not able to have the needs met. Um, it was this way for me to get my needs met in an indirect, um, you know, harmful way. But 
So yeah, eating disorders, um, I mean, it's important to say, are not about the food. They're really complex mental health disorders that so often develop as a way to help individuals survive and thrive in really tough circumstances um, until eventually they don't and negatively impact every area of life. Uh, so academically um, at Claremont, I studied neuroscience and got a BA in neuroscience and then my master's from UCLA, um, where I focused on addiction and impulse control. Um, and studying neuroscience was definitely a way for me to intellectualize my own life experiences and eating disorder. Um, and I, I was not yet ready at that time in my life, nor had the support to actually get help. Um, so yeah, I think that was my way to like kind of study myself and try to figure it out. Um, and then later, ended up doing my own recovery journey. And yeah, all of those pieces brought me to the work I do at Open them. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting thinking through all these pieces that are so like clearly connected. Like I think when you zoom, like when you're like in the thick of it, those connections might not seem so obvious, but then when you zoom out, you're like, oh yeah, this is clearly a path, a pathway. I know that we were on a run recently and you talked about how you know, you've been on, you, you struggled, I think a lot through college with bone stress injuries and we're spending kind of large chunks of your year on crutches every year. And so I'm wondering, you know, talking a little bit, we've talked a lot about college programs and the culture that surrounds a lot of college programs and teams. And I'm just wondering, you know, ending up running in college, studying, you know, studying neuroscience, what was that experience like in that in that team environment that either fed forward or fed into kind of what was going on with yourself personally at that point? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. It was, and I think something too, that I've, I've realized in the more and more interactions I have with clients um, and friends who have run in college is that my story is like, is just so common. And that is one of the most heartbreaking things, aspects of it, I think, is that, right, I graduated class of 2007, and I have clients I meet every single week who share me, share their story with me, and it's just like the same story over and over again. Um, but yeah, a lot of my experience, even the summer going into the college program, was that we were tracking mileage and would receive these weekly updates in the mail back then, um, through like snail mail about, um, it was just a list of names and um, list of mileage run each week and accumulated miles. And it was just this direct comparison. Um, and for me being like, I just totally ran away with all of that. Um, and so I entered my freshman year um, and won this backpack that said the most um, summer miles ever run and was very proud of myself. Um, you know, and was praised for this and rewarded. And there was a lot of, also in these um, weekly packets, there was a lot of tips often from like runner's world back then on like really like diet tips and ways to lean down. And it was just so, I mean, just unfortunately, like I, again, like I said, just ran away with it. And like my over-controlled personality totally latched onto that as I think, so many of us distance runners like have these traits of perfectionism, people pleasing, rigidity. Um, yeah. And so I, so yeah, I entered as like running the most miles ever run in the summer and then spent the next three years on and off crutches. Um, the things that make us like amazing athletes and amazing ultra endurance athletes. Now, all three of us also, I think are our predilections towards control. And when you talk, think about disordered eating or, or eating disorders as, as a control or coping mechanism, it's like, I feel like the trait robustness of those two things overlapping is really, really high. Yes, totally. Yeah. I think that, I mean, so much of my own personal work and the work I do with clients is about talking. Well, one, um, first understanding like what this eating disorder or what these traits are doing for us. And I think first honoring that, right. And seeing it as this way of, and I think that honoring is important to move us out of shame um, and to see that like, okay, this way I related specifically in that example was absolutely a way for me to be seen 
to be accepted, to gain belonging, um, like to gain this love and sense of community that is so important to all of us as humans. Um, and yeah, I was doing it in a really harmful way. Um, but yeah, I think the more, the more like we can first come, come at it from a place of understanding and then a lot of self-compassion work and then moving away from like, okay, how can we use these traits? Not as a live, not as a liability, but maybe as an asset. Um, and how can we also relate to ourselves in like softer and gentler ways? Um, and I, I mean, I think that is where good, where mentorship is and like coaching is so, so important. Um, and I've yeah had the fortune to have some really great coaches over the last couple of years um, as an adult runner um, who have helped me move away from those harmful ways of relating to movement. Um, and it's it's hard. Like as I, as I had, I mean, at least twenty years of experience on this planet. Like being told this is the way you train, this is the way that you relate to your body. You know, push through all these harmful messages. Like more is better. Uh, yeah, it takes, it's taken a lot and takes like continual daily practices and continual um, coaching to move away from that. Yeah. Model modeling and reminders. I think early on, you mentioned that you've kind of been on your, you've been on your own recovery path and you've been in recovery for 14 years. You have three kids under the age of, of 13. And I'm kind of wondering before we dive into the work that you do specifically now at Opal and talking more, I think too, about your, your kids and, and parenthood later on, just talking about that kind of all coalescing of, of being a young mother or being a young expectant mother and this kind of recovery timeline for yourself personally. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a really, really hard time in life. (laughs) And I think it's something that is probably why I'm so drawn to working with mothers. Um, and anytime we have mothers or clients at Opal, like I just feel this like tenderness towards them and towards working with them. Cause I think that being a parent is, and like a primary parent, I will use that term, um, is, is just so hard and such an impossible task, um, some days in this world. And so I think that, yeah, when I found out that, um, well, I, I got married very young and that has a lot to do with, um, part of my upbringing being my p- parents are very, um, rigid Catholics. And so I, I was still kind of in that framework, um, got married when I was, I think 21, 21 or 22, can't remember, but so young. Um, and then, yeah, found myself, um, pregnant very soon after. And so I, when I found out I was having, um, a baby girl was definitely when I got really serious about my recovery and knew like, okay, this is not, um, I think I had enough awareness that, it was not something I wanted to bring into my child's life. And I remember being like, that was the thing I was most afraid of. And back at that time, I almost thought like, oh, this is inevitable. I'm just going to have this daughter and she's going to struggle with her own body image, with um, disordered eating. And I think such a cool thing that I have experienced is that like, it doesn't have to be that way. And actually it's, it hasn't been at all. And I think that is, the power of like choosing to do the work, whether, and that looks different for everyone, you know, whether it's um, eating disorder recovery work or addiction or just relating or like, or therapy or self-compassion work, um, just different ways we can relate to ourselves. I think with more gentleness um, is really, really important. Um, I think a lot about the quote um, that Maya Angelou said that we do better when we know better. And I think that my parents, you know, they're complicated and relationships are complicated, um, but they're very still, very much still a part of my life. And I, as a parent now, I have so much compassion for them. And truly, I can see that they did the best they could with what they knew. Um, And a lot of that was still not a very good job. And a lot of it was extremely harmful. Um, So, yeah, I think that like the self-compassion work is extremely important in recovery and in parenting and really for everyone. I'd also say like, if you're listening and you are a parent or anyone um, and you are realizing like things that the way you talk to yourself or the way you talk about movement or food or your body is in a negative way, one, like that's okay. And I'd say now like do better and that it's never too late to learn, to change, to grow. Um, I mean, I know those 
early years of being a mother, like I'm, I'm such a different, I mean, almost a completely different person, I feel like, than I was in those early years. Um, and I parent from a different, very different place now, like from the work I continue to learn and experience, I mean, daily. And I think that, yeah, the process of growth is really messy, um, but I'm really intentional about how I talk about food. Um, for example, like zero food judgments are allowed in our house. There's no good food or bad food. There's no morality attached to food or the way people eat. Um, no food rules. I eat everything, model and all foods fit mentality. Um, definitely no talk of like earning your food. Um, no commenting on bodies, period. Um, my daughters, yeah, it's, you mentioned my daughters, they're competitive gymnasts um, and they have been since ages two and three, um, which even that and like knowing what I know now, would I have put them in that sport back then? Probably not. Um, but I do like, I absolutely bet their coaches and their coaches are incredible um, and they love the sport. And so they are still involved in it. And I mean, they want to go to the highest level. Um, they have aspirations of competing in college, but I'd say like, yeah, I'm, I am so continually inspired by, by them. And um, my 12 year old recently went through, she had a pretty bad injury um, where she, she's had a traumatic injury to her knee where she launched herself off the beam, did some crazy skill, and it ended up with a dislocated knee and tore um, multiple tendons. So it was eight months of rest and eight months of time off her sport, and especially in a 12-year-old's life. Like that is a significant portion of time. Um, and I kept thinking to myself about like running injuries I've had and times that I've had bone stress injuries and had to take time off and how in the past, I mean, definitely in college, how like my entire world fell apart when I was injured. And then watching this 12-year-old, you know, just cope with it. Um, and like explore other parts of her identity. And she started, and I won't talk forever about my kids, but like she picked up the cello and got really into playing the cello. Of course, uh, TV show Wednesday was popular at the time too. So she could like use her, like take out her anger and frustration with music. And yeah, I just think that there's, it's cool to see how like changing the way we relate with our bodies and food um, can have a major impact on everyone around us. Yeah, I think we'll circle back to some of that uh, kind of like directive of of what you do and how that influences how how you parent more specifically. But I guess this would be a great time to kind of launch into what what you do do. You work at, as you mentioned at Opal Food and Body Wisdom in Seattle, and I'm I'm really curious. I, I've heard a little bit about Opal um, via Amelia Boone and other and other folks, and I'm just I'm curious for everyone like what is Opal and then what is Body Wisdom because I really like that. Uh, that qualifier on it. It seems like that seems like a really interesting notion around a um, like a treatment, a treatment facility or treatment uh, center here in Seattle. Yeah, cool. Um, yes, I'm glad you mentioned Mealy Boone because I I actually have never told her this, nor I've shared it with many people. But a reason I work at Opal is because of Amelia, um, and because of a social media post she had posted a few years ago. Um, which was essentially saying that Opal was hiring and looking for people. And I saw her post and had just moved to Seattle. Um, I think I had known of Opal probably from some of Amelia's previous posts. But um, anyway, at the time I was working in private practice fully, um, seeing, yeah, mostly with collegiate runners, but saw Amelia's post and her speaking so highly of Opal and um, basically went in for a job interview like the next day. And then um, I think I didn't even tell my husband and then um, like took the job and was like, okay, I'm starting on Monday. Um, and this was right. This was in September three years ago. Yeah. So 2020. Um, so during COVID and Opal. So yeah, to go back um, to what Opal is though, it's an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle located in the university district. Um, Opal's mission is to free people from diet culture by offering treatment for food, body and exercise concerns. Um, and Opal's exercise and sport program, um, which is a part of the team that I work on, has been specifically designed to help clients explore their relationship to exercise, sport, and movement, and to support athletes with eating disorders. Um, the overall goal of the exercise and sports program is to target disorders of over-control 
um, which I can more specifically talk about in a bit too. Um, but and also to increase cognitive flexibility, decrease rigidity, um, support clients in tuning into their own body wisdom. And through group movement sessions, process groups, um, one-on-one experiential client sessions, um, I get to engage in movement-specific work with clients, um, mostly focused on like playfulness, embodiment, joy, um, finding pleasure through movement, which can be super scary <laughs> to people, um, challenging harmful thoughts and urges, and helping them move towards joy and freedom. Um, I think a really, well, one two important things to note is one that opal is only still to this day like one of four or five eating disorder treatment centers in the entire country that have athlete specific programs um and and still some of those other programs don't they have a specific athlete track so basically if you qualify as like an elite enough athlete then you can enter the exercise and sport program at Opal, the way that they designed it intentionally from the beginning um, over a decade ago was that everyone, we consider everyone an athlete. Like everyone is a mover. Everyone is an athlete. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that is, it is so cool because um, like even, even right now, um, the clients I currently am working with one-on-one range from a world champion um, to individuals who are deeply avoidant of exercise, who live in larger bodies. Um, who really have a lot of intense fear of moving in front of others, um, especially because of the way that society judges, like what bodies are athletes, who is an athlete. Um, And we also have a significant um, proportion of our clients are non-binary or transgender. And so I get to work a lot with clients on like gender expression and the way that that impacts their ability to feel, um, you know, feel safe even like in movement spaces. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit about the work we do. Yeah. But it's also so in, incredible. Like I, I, I don't think I know a whole lot about what's available out there. I, I had friends who went to various um, inpatient and outpatient settings, like in the twin cities and stuff growing up in, in the Midwest um, for, for treatment for various um, eating related stuff and, and all of them were athletes. And it's like, you know, hearing about this program and its relationship of allowing exercise, exploring exercise, exploring movement seems really holistic. Um, and I just don't think that that's a widely available or at least how many of us would think of like quote unquote treatment when we think about struggling with our body or our relationship to food or our relationship to our body and sport, et cetera. So I just think that's a very unique mm-hmm. setting that I don't think a lot of people even realize is available to them. Yeah. And it gets rid of the bias of body size in relation to eating disorder, right? Because a lot of people like to be like, oh, that person doesn't look like they have an eating disorder. That does not matter whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. And so I like how you say like everybody's an athlete. It doesn't matter. Like your relationship with movement is important regardless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is so true. I think that is like one of the most harmful myths that continues to be so prevalent about eating disorders is who actually, yeah, who looks like they have an eating disorder, like what, and the fact that like people think eating disorders have a look. Um, yeah, and I think the the minimization of behaviors and of the disorder is so it's just such a huge part of the disorder itself um like in the fact that I truly have never ever met with a client who thinks that they are sick enough to need treatment um and I mean that was like so much of my own experience too and not getting treatment and not having coaches and and parents and mentors and like even doctors get me the help I needed was that it was always um yeah, it was just like never that idea of like never being sick enough. And I think that it's cool to see, well, one that is like that eating disorder treatment is leading into a different way. Um, and that, yeah, it will be see like such a wide variety of clients and that, and I think the, yeah, another piece too, is like the group movement sessions we do, I think are so powerful. Um, and I've heard, yeah, I've heard Amelia speak about this too, how, her experience and a lot of clients share this experience that it is really powerful to be in um, like a pro- one of our process groups that I lead 
every Wednesday is titled Rethinking Exercise and Sport. And we bring in different topics. One, one for example, is on like athlete identity. And we have this discussion with everyone there. And so again, it can be like world champions in the room to someone who hasn't engaged in intentional sport or exercise in decades. And to hear, I think it's so powerful to like hear everyone's diverse um, perspectives and where they're coming from, rather than just to have like all the elite athletes, you know, or all these people who have a lot of similar, similar experiences. Yeah. When you were kind of explaining what you what you specifically do there you mentioned over control and kind of a, a number of sub um kind of sub qualities um including things like rigidity and um those types of mindsets and as you were saying them i kind of got chills cuz they are things that i think i see reflected in our endurance world so frequently. And I'm just wondering if you could explain a little bit further, kind of like, what is, what does that encompass? And like, how do you work with people to work through over control in their, in their life and their relationship to exercise and their body, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I, yeah, I think that is, um, well, it's probably clear that I love every aspect of my work so much. Um, but I think the the radically open dialectical behavioral therapy has just been like so life changing and eye opening for me as well. Um, it is a relatively newer therapeutic technique, um, branching off of traditional DBT dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, but DBT is known to be DBT involves a lot of lists and and a lot of rigidity, a lot of like okay, let's plan this out. This is how we're going to tackle it, and essentially that. It's not, it has found to not be the most effective um, therapeutic modality for disorders over, over control, including a lot of eating disorders, because people who are over controlled already are way too rigid, take life way too seriously. Like we don't need more rules and lists. Um, so, yeah, ROGBT, to speak a little bit about it first, and then within over control is an evidence based um, trans diagnostic technique. So meaning that it can be applied to many different diagnoses. Um, it was developed by Dr. Thomas Lynch to treat disorders of, of over control. Um, so over control is considered to be a personality style that actually underlies diagnoses and the treatment target for them is loneliness. Um, so those who are over control, which frankly, as you said, includes a significant a proportion of distance runners and ultra runners, um, probably most, um, they're often characterized by inhibited emotional expression. You know, we are the detail-oriented, perfectionist, highly organized, hardworking, disciplined, rigid, compliant, submissive, often um, inflexible in thinking and behavior. Um, but RO, so RODBT um, essentially posits that loneliness is a core underlying cause of various mm -hmm. eating disorders and also um, also some other um, some other disorders that RODBT treats too is treatment resistant depression, anxiety, and autism spectrum disorders. Um, so it's this like really cool evidence-based um, kind of skills technique that we use. Um, so my work with clients and also the work I continue to practice with myself um, focuses a lot on values. So an example can be like asking yourself, does this decision align with my values? Um, self-inquiry is another big piece of it, um, which self-inquiry is a really cool practice. And really, it's about getting honest with ourselves and asking, as we term them, um, asshole questions. So those really hard questions that get us close to our edge um, or that help us ask, um, what might this discomfort be teaching me or telling me? Um, so it's all about so much of like the self-inquiry practice within um, treating disorders of over control is about turning towards discomfort and asking my, what you might learn from it um, rather than like calming, distracting, numbing, or dismissing it. Um, so one, like a, I'll just provide an example of like a simple way for anyone to anyone who's listening who might want to practice self-inquiry is to just um, pull out a journal. You can do a self-inquiry journal practice. Um, it's supposed to be limited to five minutes a day. Um, as my co-leader and one of the Opal founders, Lexi, always says, she's like, we want to visit the cemetery, but not build a house in it. 
Um, so it's five minutes a day to get into this deep practice. And you basically want to reflect on an experience that um, maybe brought up some discomfort for you recently. And then you can ask yourself, like, basically, what can I learn from this experience? And spend about five minutes. Um, and as you write, you might land on a few questions um, that take you deeper into discovering your personal unknown. And I think that um, like learning to live in this way by practicing values-based decision-making, self-inquiry, um, yeah, as I had said, like really has changed my life profoundly over the past couple of years. Um, and it informs, like I was thinking about how it really informs um, everything, but something, you know, it can seem small, but also running is a big part of our lives. So like it even informs the races I choose to do. Um, or the distances or the people and communities I spend that I choose to spend time with. I think that the older I get and like as a busy mother, I time is definitely my most precious asset. Um, and so a specific example is like how I'm using this process to build race calendars um, that fit into my family and my own schedules. Um, and I think that this is maybe taking it on a tangent, but like I, I hear so many um, runners, especially kind of, and I have like definitely fallen prey to this process in the past of getting so carried away by like what other, what races other people are doing or what races are the most important. And I say that in quotes. Um, and it's really hard to like center back in and go back and that can like, even I'm thinking of the body wisdom practice. It can be like, you know, hand on heart, closing your eyes, trying to notice like what sensations come up when I think about doing this one race versus doing this other race. Um, and it's so, I mean, it can be a hard practice to do, but also like so simple. I think the more you practice it, you can come back and be like, okay, what aligns with my values? Like, where is this bringing me? And what, yeah, which values does it connect with? Where does it fit into my life? Um, and yeah, it's a practice that I think um, really helps me to make decisions and then trying to help, um, yeah, clients for sure. And my children to just like guide them through similar processes and um, in decision making. I think it's so interesting because I think that while I can see how in a therapeutic setting, that is of like a extremely powerful practice, but I'm just sitting here like reflecting on my like day to day as an athlete or as a coach even, and recognizing where those things have a lot of added value in my own life or in my athletes' lives. I.e., I have asked athletes to like, what are their values type of thing when we're setting up kind of like working on some of these mental skills for a you know take taking on a big race this summer for example. And like having to kind of dive into like, well, what does that mean by values? And I'm like, well, like what, like if, you know, this time goal or this place goal is not on the table, like what, like having something rooted in your values allows you to like continue on in hardship. And I, like, again, we're going to bring up Amelia Boone on, on, on again, and we're going to have her on the podcast. Actually, um, she'll come out, I think a couple, a couple episodes after, after you, but you know, she's like, I don't, I avoid exercise that I don't find joy doing. And that like, to me is, you know, like, so that value has been identified. Joy is an important value for her. And so if the thing does not bring her joy, like she's not going to do it. And so I just think like trying to figure out what those values are in and around your own racing in and around your own career in and around your own family goes beyond this like therapeutic setting in a way that I think is so incredibly valuable. So it's not really a question. That's just like a, a long poetic statement that I, that is dawning on me right now. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think it's so related to how um, even to like to any daily practice, but thinking of like to daily movement and um, running practices, I think there's a like a big question that I work through with any with any client I work with, but I'm thinking specifically of runners since this is a running podcast is um, is really getting in touch with their values and getting in touch with like what aspects of running feel like pure and joyful and wonderful to you and which aspects of it like has like where has the eating disorder co-opted certain aspects of it and where does it feel harmful um, or compulsive or tied yeah tied to like compulsive behaviors or avoidance 
Um, and I mean, it's, it is, yeah, to be, I'm, I'm all about vulnerability these days. And I think it, it is a practice that I check in with myself on too. If I'm like no, noticing an urge, especially as, um, I think in the Pacific Northwest, all of us are experiencing like there's sunshine and the mountains are thought out and there's such, I was just noting in my training log, um, my coach is David Roche and currently, and I was noting it to him yesterday that like I'm having increased urges to go run more. And in the past, I would have just like gone with that thought that like, it's beautiful out. I'm going to go run all the doubles or all the miles and just like totally throw my training plan out the window. And I think though, I've learned the hard way enough times that like running myself into the ground um, is not effective and leads to injury and leads to overtraining. Um, but I think without that ability to like slow down and question, like why question, you know, the motivation, the intention, like, why are we doing this? Same with races, same with, yeah, with the daily training process. Like, I think it's really important that to listen to your body, listen to what you want. Um, you know, if I wake up and I'm just like really, really not feeling it that day for a run, I know that is not typical for me. And so that is a place where I like absolutely will not go for a run and will decide to rest or do something else. But yeah, I think for all of, for most of us distance runners, like being so over controlled, um, right. We don't need people to tell us to do more or to push harder or to like ignore our body mm -hmm. sensations. I think it's much of the opposite. Yeah. I had an athlete the other day say like, I'm not in the mood to run. I don't feel like I should. And I'm like, that's fine. Like you are very driven. You always run. And so if you don't want to, or you're feeling like you shouldn't, then please do not. And like, I'm glad that people are starting to check in with themselves because running through things that you feel like inherently, you know, you shouldn't do is like obviously very detrimental. So yeah, yeah I relate. So cool. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And I just, I think like coaches, yeah. Like you as a coach Keely and, and Corinne um, and being able to be those coaches who like celebrate that and encourage their athletes mm -hmm. to not just push through mm -hmm. or like ignore how they're feeling. Yeah. We're seeing that right now. I mean, we, we deal with smoke here at some point every summer or fall mm -hmm. in the East coast right now for, you know, does not happen very often out there. They have been inundated by horrible air quality. And I'm seeing from a lot of athletes who are really struggling with uh, not necessarily like exercise addiction, because I think that that is, I mean, we're learning more and more about that and that's probably tied into over control, but it's this like, they can't, paper. <laughs> they can't not run. Right. Like it's the, like, yeah. they know they shouldn't run because the air, the AQI is like 200, but they can't cut themselves some slack or recognize that like, it's not worth it type of thing. And I'm just wondering you know, that, that is not necessarily in the eating disorder space, but there's obviously clear overlaps of this, like this control, this compulsion, this need to go do something. And I'm wondering how we can help athletes relate to that of this, like, what, like, what is the inherent value? How can I remove myself from the situation where I feel this stress or pressure or need to go run, even though I know it's like, like literally in hazardous conditions or maybe they're running through an injury etc like this this is obviously a very extreme example with the air, air quality right now but it's very very real for a lot of athletes yeah i mean i think that is yeah it is so real and it's something that like we all experience to different degrees and i think that it is something to get for athletes to get really curious about um i mean it can be even like kind of doing that self inquiry process of noticing that like okay it's smoky outside or I have a niggle, I have this pain, but I'm having this intense urge to go run anyway. And then I think it's, right, It it's hard, it's simple and yet it's so hard, but to like pause and get curious about it of like, what is actually underlying this urge and this thought that I need to go engage in movement right now. And I think like, it does take me back to um, the notion I was talking about in the beginning with eating disorders being a coping tool, and I would say compulsive exercise too is an incredibly powerful coping tool. Um, and it helps move us towards like, let's say on a, 
it can help us move, help move us towards almost a sense of safety and sense of like being okay or being enough. But yeah, I think so often if we can disrupt those patterns and learn, like a lot of it is disrupting it and learning to sit, practicing stillness. Um, and it's hard. It's really hard when like you have a long pattern as I do of, um, I would say even of exercise addiction or of, a, of compulsive movement, it's hard to move away from that, but also it's so worth it and so valuable um, and and really possible. So yeah, with, with any client who comes to Opal, their first two weeks, I mean, almost without exception, first two weeks is on minimal clearance. And that's a period of time where we ask them to only engage in acts of daily living. So like walking, <laughs> Yeah, just walking around, getting to and from Opal, and that is it. Um, and it is like the most painful two weeks for most people, and brings up so much, and everyone hates it. And I get, have a lot of check-ins because yeah, they're like, I mean, crawling out of their skin, and especially right if you think of like an ultra runner, you're used to engaging in many, many hours of running a week and then to go to like just acts of daily living. And yet I think that is the most um, powerful, like one of the most powerful practices that we have people do because it's in that time where we help teach them new coping tools and other ways to deal with like discomfort and sit in the uncomfortable emotions um, that at some point in life, like we all are going to have to experience and yeah, it's like, are you, are, I often think, I'm like, are you going to run away from your problems for the rest of your life? Or are you going to learn to like truly just sit um, and kind of like sit in that shit? Yeah. And I think that's so, that's so important. And I tell athletes during, during times where it's like environmental impact of why they can't exercise or exercise to the degree they would like to, right? It's like, okay, you can run on the treadmill or you can run, go for a very short run outside, or you can ride the trainer. It's this idea of like, I'm like, yeah, like I'd rather you sit in this right now and feel it and figure it out and journal it out and like ask yourself why over like, you know, the kind of like, why do I feel this way? I feel this way because of, okay, like why, why do I have that sensation or that, that feeling, et cetera. And kind of like start to pick at it a little bit, because I think it's way easier to do it in those moments where it's a, a week here or a couple days there versus, you know, a bone stress injury where suddenly like you don't get to exercise for six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks as you mend, mend bone. That is a really hard place to go, you know, completely exercise free in a mentally sustainable way. And so I, I do think, yeah, it's an opportunity to sit in that discomfort and know that it's only temporary and know that you're going to be running in clean air, you know, come Saturday type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that if, um, yeah, again, it's like different degree for everyone. And so I think sitting, yeah, asking them to sit in that is so awesome and so powerful. And then I'd say like, if someone is trying to sit through that and truly feels like they can't, um, then that is definitely a, another place to get curious about and be like, okay, maybe this is where I bring in that, like where I bring in the help of a therapist or need further support. Um, right. Cause I think, yeah, it's for a lot of times when clients come to us, they're like, but I truly don't have. And I know like, that's where I was. Um, even as a young mother, I think about that. Well, like I, if my kids were three kids were just like losing their shit and yelling at each other and fighting. I knew I could put them in their running stroller and just like get out of there. Um, and I think it was an escape, like looking back at it. And like, that was a way for me to not sit in the discomfort of all these uncomfortable feelings and emotions. Um, in some of, in these old stories of like how I wasn't good enough, or maybe like I wasn't a good enough mother. And it truly was. Yeah. It took, it took, injuries it took bone stress injuries usually of like not being able to do that to then learning other coping tools um you know which some can be like journaling reading writing reach out to a friend uh, therapy yeah knitting, like therapy so, therapy yeah. and knitting and a good yeah. friend and a good book yeah. I think that we'd love to touch again uh before we let you go today about parenting and your kids particularly your two daughters in gymnastics, um, you talked a lot about your personal experience and the work you do at Opal and this continual growing and, you know, 
knowing what you know now versus knowing what you knew even just, you know, three years ago type of thing. I'm wondering, you know, no, no sport is immune to negative influence. And I'm wondering, you know, you said that you vetted, you like, you vet the coaches for gymnastics, et cetera. Like how have you navigated athletics with all three of your kids as they explore their, their athleticism and their independence and everything that comes along with, you know, putting kids into to sports and onto teams. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely been kind of just like most things in parenting of like learning as you go, most things in life. And, um, one of the things we say in our, our ODBT is, um, F around and find out. And that is how I think a, a great way to learn, especially for over-controlled people who are maybe like afraid of taking risks and trying new things is like, what would it be like to try this thing and find out? And so, yeah, I think that, um, it's interesting watching each of my children who are so different, but their own like relationships with sport develop. Um, yeah, as I mentioned like the two, my two daughters do gymnastics really competitively and yeah, we bet the coaches, it's a huge part of it. Um, really. And yeah, I think so much of it also, it, so much of it comes from like starting at home of like making that home environment a safe, um, a safe, positive place where kind of that like soft landing place where they're always going to feel loved and feel like unconditionally seen and supported. Um, so yeah, I think I, I really try to do that in our own house. Um, I'd said those specifics, how we relate to food and don't talk about bodies. Um, but I think on like team environments and for coaches too, that's a place to just not have any space for that. Um, and to take it really seriously, to celebrate as like a community of eaters um, is often how I think of it. And all I know they're in, I think it's, I mean, the way it's like being really intentional about the way you live and who you spend your time with and what communities you're a part of. And like, I know my um, running groups and my social communities, like it is so important for me that, that we are all a community of eaters. And that we listen to our bodies and respect our bodies um, because I know it's so easy to get like swept away by negative influences when we're not doing that. Um, but I think some other things too in our home is um, is like celebrating and nourishing and honoring our bodies, listening to sensations, tuning into needs, um, full acceptance, which is really hard, but full acceptance of rest and slowing down. And like my neighbor calls it couch time, um, which I love because my son will come home and be like, I just need some couch time today. Um, and yeah, in my, like in my family of origin, I feel, I know, like I never felt like it was safe to sit down on the couch midday. And actually even thinking of that, like brings up um, this like sensation of anxiety um, because it wasn't safe. Like we were always, there was always something to be cleaned or something to be doing. And so I really, like, it's one of my biggest struggles, but I do really try every day to practice just sitting and doing nothing, um, to enjoy the practice of not doing, even engaging in activities. Yeah. Like purely for pleasure. So I think that's really important. It's like modeling that for friends and for kids. Um, yeah, my, my son who I, I didn't mention much, but like he has been cool to parent him too, because naturally he has a much lower appetite for movement than anyone else in our family. And I feel like it's such this like secret blessing um, because he is a really good model of, and like always has been of intuitive movement and of listening to his body. Um, and so, you know, some days there are days where he'll ask me to like go on a trail run and squawk. And then there's days that he just wants to chill on the couch all day. And it's like, so, and can do that naturally. So I think that the more we can like lean into that, um, to have and like to remove any sense of like should or guilt or shame from movement is so important. Um, as a mother, I also model taking time for myself. I think like that's important to say and even the same quotes, but being selfish, um, if you will, meeting my own needs first at times, um, which I mean, might look like, I mean, it looks like a lot of scheduling and puzzle piecing. And I think for most of us, we have such busy lives, but looks like being intentional, you know, sitting down with my partner and saying like, Hey, I want to go play in the mountains tomorrow morning with friends. Like, how can we make that work? And then asking him and checking in with, you know, with everyone's needs of like, okay, then what do you need? Like, when can I support you? So you can get out on a mountain bike ride. 
Um, but I think that, yeah, as I, as I work with many mothers and like seeing so many friends who are mothers, how society I think teaches us to give up so many pieces of ourselves for our kids um, or for our families. And I know I fell prey to that early on as a parent, um, really to the point that I feel like I gave up so many pieces of myself that I hardly knew myself anymore. Um, so yeah, trail running for me, because it just is one of my favorite things in the world, um, continues to be that way to take time for myself, to connect with myself, with nature, with friends, um, with competition. And yeah, I think even like the ultra distances of like 50 plus miles um, provides such this precious time to like be quiet and yeah. in the mountains and to like explore myself and continue to learn and grow. Yeah. The you time, the you time is so important. I've seen you navigate that firsthand and our, our friends navigate it firsthand. I love a 50 mile or a hundred mile race where I'm not beholden to my phone or email for 24 hours. It's pretty great. I guess to, to wrap things up, cause we're kind of hitting our, our wall on time here. We could talk for forever. I think just one last kind of quick takeaway for the, the audience is, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. You've been raising kids for a while. You've been working in this field for a long time. Like I'm wondering what you know now that you wish you knew, you know, 13 years ago. Mm. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So much. Um, but the top thing that comes to mind that, yeah, I can't believe I didn't even mention once is, is just the importance of like eating enough always and eating so much food. And I think that is, um, right. It's like simple and again, so hard because I think the messages in our society and in our sport and culture, Um, but a client said to me the other day, she was like, it's amazing what my body, how good my body feels running when I'm actually eating. I love it. Right. It's like, yeah, we laugh and like both of us were laughing about it. Like, yeah, it's like not, it's uh, part of me is just like, why does it have to be that? And I just, yeah, I wish for my younger self that it wasn't so hard. Um, and I continue to see, yeah, even at, I just turned 38 a couple of days ago. And I feel like the more I eat, um, like the more I'm like, I don't think I've gotten anywhere like near my athletic potential. Um, because we're if talking, we eat a lot yeah. of food, we can do amazing things. We've mm-hmm. talked about that a lot, how there's a lot of untapped female potential. And I think a lot of it is tied up mm-hmm. in food. I guess we're going to have to let you go, but is there anywhere that people can find you if they need, if they want to get a hold of you, if they want to learn more about Opal or what you're doing, where can we, where can we send them? Yeah. Um, probably best is either just through my direct email, my Opal email, um, which is Caitlin at Opal food and body.com. And I can get to you for the show notes, um, or Instagram, which is, I think it's Kate.Jacobson, but I can provide that. (laughs) To we'll um, link it. We'll link it all yeah. in the show notes. Yeah. We've decided that that could have been a two hour interview and we'll have to have Caitlin back on to talk about really anything. So if you've got specific questions that you might have for someone like Caitlin, Caitlin Jacobson, send them our way because we absolutely loved getting to sit down and, and have this very therapeutic conversation. I know for me, there were things like, kind of the, like the inquiry, the personal inquiry and the like, kind of just like sitting with something for five minutes and journaling it out. I've recognized that I am a frenetic, chaotic individual who sometimes just like blasts through my emotions and doesn't deal with them until I absolutely have to. And like remembering that I can do that in any setting, like sitting down and taking those five minutes is a super, like incredibly important reminder in my life. And I was really just like pleasantly unaware that that was going to come up in that conversation. And I feel really grateful that I feel we got a mini therapy session with Caitlin and that was really beautiful. Yeah, I know. And something that really struck home with me was how she talked about um, her relationship with her children and her relationship with herself once she decided to have kids and how she realized that just because you were raised a certain way or you developed a certain disorder that doesn't mean you have to give those problems to your children like you get to be the creator of their new narrative you don't have to give them your problems and like I just felt like that was so powerful because I think a lot of people think that they are stuck in a way and like 
they have to like portray those things off to their children, even if it's not conscious, like subconsciously, but like we get to change that. We don't have to predispose our children to those same tendencies we have by like subconsciously doing all of these things that would be really negative for someone's opinion of food or body image. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think as a pair, like I'm not a parent yet, but I think about having kids and, Mm -hmm. and what that might be like. And it's, I think people like Caitlin are a really grounding life force when it comes to being a parent in this day and age and, and, and yeah, and raising really athletic kids who you want to protect culturally in the world of sports. So Caitlin, you're amazing. We love you so much. And we can't wait to have you back on the podcast at some point in time, before we let you all go, we have to do a society slam society slam is brought to you by our friends over at Petzl. Keely, you're currently in Tahoe getting ready for Western States. How many Petzls do you have with you? <laughs> I packed four. <laughs> So I have two of my OG nows and then I have the new now RL, which I'm going to actually try this coming weekend. I'm going to do a night run with Jeff, who's going to be my pacer in the dark. Nice. On the part that we're running in the dark. (laughs) Nice. Um, And I'm going to try it there and see how I like it and and bring both of my headlamps. But I have a feeling based off your anecdotal experience with it that I'm going to really like the now RL, especially because it's a lot lighter. Um, yeah. it's super light. One. It's so, it's really nice on your head. Yeah, so I'm really excited to try it out. It'll probably be my go-to headlamp for for Western states, um, and then I'll have my OG now as the backup. Sick. I love yeah. it. Oh, yeah, I just have my bindi with me because I will not be pacing anyone. I will be sitting on the track from 4 a.m. to midnight. <clears throat> I'm hopefully talking about you as you run around the track, and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> um, what do you have for us for Society Slam this week? All right. So I pulled two from the Instagram message board. And again, they are kind of questions. So I kind of liked the question flow from last week. So we're going to go through that again. Um, Okay. So I have someone here who is wanting advice around work-life balance. She's going to give us a little background on her situation. So she is a farmer and works a super physical job. And she's wondering about how to go into training for big races while also having really big work months and how you can like have a balance between having to work in the field all day, you know, as a farmer doing a lot of really heavy tasks and then also having to do runs and then potentially even do workouts like after work. Like how do you balance those two things from like a personal perspective and then even from a coaching perspective, like how would you address that Corinne? Yeah, it's super tricky. And I think with athletes like that, that have a super demanding time of year, part of that is reflecting on what they want to race. And is it best to maybe target races that don't mean that they have to do their heaviest training of the year during their highest work stress volume? You know, work is stressful if it's physical or or otherwise. And so trying to like match those things up, I think is really, really important. Or I've got athletes that live like in the world's hottest places and they're like, I don't really want to train peak volume in July. I'm Mm -hmm. not going to like, they'll target races pre summer heat and post summer heat where they don't have to physically exert themselves to that degree. And I think that that's the first conversation I would have with this person is what, what, is there something that you really want to race that conflicts with that? And then is there a way that we can shift what you're racing to set you up for not the hardest time of like the physical labor that they're doing in, in like on their farm in the fields. Um, so that might mean racing a spring race ahead of planting. And that might mean racing a later fall race so that they can get through parts of harvest. I know depending on what they, what kind of farm they have, that will shift around a whole lot, but trying to figure mm-hmm. out like wh- where's the, where's the most mentally taxing, physically taxing part of their year and trying to shape their training in a way that fits that. If that's not an option, say they really want to do something that's smack in the middle of all this. Yeah. Say they're doing a race that coincides with some of their heinously, heinously busy months. Right. And so it's like that maybe, maybe that falls into taper, for example, and you're still doing a lot of spring training ahead of some of like some of your biggest volume is still ahead of that. That might not be that bad actually, but yeah, if, if they're combined my take there is, are there weeks where you can lean on some other people or not? Like how much of this is on you versus how much of this is on staff, et cetera. You know, is there, is there a way where you can take a lighter work week to have a heavier training week or a couple, you know, a heavier training week and then a heavier work week and then a heavier training week type of thing. If that's not an option, it's like the stress is stress is stress equation in which it's like, your volume cap is just going to be probably a little bit lower and probably best for it to be a little bit lower just because your work 
itself is so physically taxing. Mm -hmm. And I think that you run the risk if you're trying to emulate someone else's training that you're going to be just freaking exhausted Mm -hmm. because you have both physically hit your limit with training and and, and your work limit as well. At the same time, that's going to be a recipe for maybe not hurting yourself, but definitely being burnt out by the end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would just re-echo the exact same thing and be like, if you are having to walk, you know, 20 K a day for your job and lift a bunch of stuff, like that's pretty good training. And so your training load from a running perspective does not need to be nearly as high as you may think it does. You're getting a lot of time on feet and stress adaptation just by working. Um, And so obviously it's not ideal. You're not going to go into the race like, cool, I've crushed all these miles but you've crushed a lot of stress and you've yeah. adapted to your body's ability to adapt to the stress. And so, you know, again, yeah. stress is stress. Yeah. I'd run, I'd probably run a lot of shorter days, like a lot of shakeout mm-hmm. days and then like maybe yeah. one workout day and trying to get one protected long run day. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, I would try to get help for a long run, mm-hmm. but then it's like your, your, a lot of your actual physical volume is just like, is manual labor. And so it's, it's honestly not dissimilar to like shift work, like nurses, right. Who are working mm-hmm. like, four tens a week, for example, Mm -hmm. they can't do a lot of training on their 10 hour days. Like, it's just like, Mm -hmm. that is a really tall ask. And so it's like, one of those is a rest day. One of those is a shakeout day, et cetera. And then, um, you know, maybe you get a little bit, maybe two of those are a shakeout day. One of those is a little bit more of an endurance day, but still pretty short. And then the actual work happens on the other days. Like there are, there are other jobs that are different, but like adjacent. So I think there are ways Mm -hmm. to do it for sure, but you have to be creative. But yeah, just, just give yourself some grace though. Cause you're crushing it and you can't only do so much. So yeah. less is probably more in your case. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question. Cool. Let's do Favorite it. Favorite hundred mile races for a first timer, i.e. Ooh. runnable or not too difficult to get into and not overly intense terrain. Yeah. I think races like Havelina are a good mm-hmm. first time hundred. It's looped. It's in the desert. It's fun. I think fun is a big factor. It's easy to crew. Um, it's, I think that one's really manageable. It can be a little bit warm, but otherwise I think it's a great first time hundred. They let a lot of people in, um, to that race. I'm trying to think of like, what are some other really good ones that come to mind? I think there's some in Oregon as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe like um, say mountain lakes, mountain lakes, um, pine to palm, Mm-hmm. Um, Oregon cascades, those yep. might be pretty good ones as far as like terrain is it's got some more Hills, but they're fairly benign. Mm-hmm. Um, those I think would all be really solid ones. Um, Vermont 100 would be another one where it's like a lot of dirt road, um, but a really cool classic race. And then in the Midwest, probably things like kettle moraine, um, mm-hmm. would be a cool one. Um, kind of midsummer but is, you know, kind of rolling on Nordic ski trail. So it's like pretty Mm -hmm. nice trail underfoot, um, but it's going to be more rolling terrain. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I guess the other looped one that might be good would be, um, oh my goodness, East coast race happens every year, looped course really fast. Devin Yanka ran the course record at it last year. Umstead. 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 Umstead would be a good one too. It's like, I think it's looped. Mm -hmm. It's, um, Rocky raccoon I, looped ones can be mentally challenging, right? Because it's like, I got to do this again. Great. But it's kind of, mm-hmm. it's easy to crew, which is nice for a first time, like first time crew. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, you're kind of running back to the same spot every time. So I think those, those would be kind of my initial tick list of races that I think are beginner friendly and very friendly to crew and spectators and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my heart goes to the mount, to Mountain Lakes 100, but I also think all the ones you said were great. Mountain Lakes is just a mountain bike, so it's just get out there, and then all you gotta do is get back. Yeah, which is and nice it has like it. very moderate climbs, so nothing crazy. Yeah, I love I love a good out and back. Actually, my hundred coming up in July just turned into an out and back. Mm, Cascade cool. Crest. We found out that there's construction that they will not let the race pass through on the back side of the loop, and so we'll be running an out and back to Hayak, um, which means we're on the PCT for like forever. Um, so more trail, less dirt roads, but yeah, it'll be good. It happens. Yeah. I mean, that's the point of a hundred is you got to roll with the punches. Yep. Sure. <laughs> sure is. The punches just came a little bit earlier this year. Yeah. Um, I think on that note, we're going to let you all go. Um, we're going to give Keely a big hoorah rah 
for Western States because she's running it in a little bit. And then um, we got to, I think we're going to do a special episode post Western States. So keep your eye on your uh, podcast feed because I think we're going to do a bonus episode with a uh, Keely post race. So don't go anywhere. You keep your eye out. You cheer extra loud for Keely. Heckle me out on the course. Yeah. <laughs> heckle, send love and vibes. And uh, until then, we'll see you out on the trail. Bye.